Welcome to Diffused Congruence. This is episode four of the American Muslim Experience. Our guest for this, our very first episode of the year 2014, is renowned fitness expert Rehan Jalali, who's here to guide us through looking better, feeling better, and uh, hoping to get better. Joining me in this endeavor, as always, is my good friend Parvez Ahmed. Good to be here, Zaki. So, uh, Pervez, why don't you introduce Rehan, because you have a little bit of history with him. I think this is a, a fun way to, to intro our, our topic for this episode. Yeah, so full disclosure, Rehan and I go way back, probably more long, or probably longer than we both like to admit. But uh, growing up in Houston, Rehan was a dear friend, so it's a real honor to have him on the show. Well, and, and just for the sake of our audience, uh, let's, let's let them know a little bit about, about uh, Rehan's background. Rehan Jalali is president of the Supplement Research Foundation. He's a nationally recognized certified sports nutritionist who's developed over 100 cutting-edge products for the dietary supplement industry. His clients include Oscar-winning actors, Emmy Award-winning TV stars, and Grammy-winning musicians. He's developed cutting-edge, customized nutrition and supplementation programs for actors getting ready for movie roles, musicians preparing for videos and celebrities peaking for appearances including award shows and i got that from his website rehanjalali.com that's r e h a n j a l a l i.com and by the way all of uh, what i just read makes me say that i'm in desperate need of rehan's help <laughs> thank you for having me guys <laughs> well thanks so much for coming on so so Pervez, why don't you take point here yeah so rehan um i know Again, as I was alluding to earlier, when I first met you, you were in high school, and I remember you were already playing varsity football. So, and I know your family, and I know that athleticism sort of goes with the genes, but uh, tell us a little bit about how you grew up, you know, and uh, were you always athletic growing up? Well, uh, you know, full disclosure as well, me and Pervez grew up in the Paleolithic era. Uh, it was a long, <laughs> long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But uh, to answer Pravez's uh, question, really what, it, what people always ask me is that, you, you, you know, your genes are DLE genes, what I call DLE genes, which is doctor, lawyer, or engineer. I mean, that's what my genes are built for. Uh, but I kind of – honestly, I, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I was a um, – Contrary to what people went towards, this is at least, uh, I try to go the opposite way as much as uh, possible following the contrarian point of view and uh, kind of try to break the mold of, uh, you know, playing sports. And it's interesting because now, I mean, obviously we have, you know, people you know, from our culture in many, many sports and doing great now. But when I was growing up, you know, it was, you know, maybe one or two other guys or you heard of somebody, hey, this guy's an athlete or whatever. So I got into it with football. You know, breaking the mold, and of course, you know, every day my parents uh, reiterating the fact that I will probably get injured, uh, and that I was not mm. built for that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> They're very encouraging, actually. But um, <laughs> anyway, so I started, you know, weight training from there, and I kind of enjoyed weight training. I was a very skinny kid. I, again, my genes were not built for this for sure. You know what I mean? It was built for, uh, you know, computer science, really. <laughs> and uh, I sort of went in the opposite direction and started training, and then went into mm bodybuilding and started competing actually because I was you know interested in it I was interested in the science behind it on how you can actually change your body your mindset your health everything through training and fitness and um, you know my family was very supportive of that and actually what's interesting is in college I was actually an accounting major to start off could you imagine really? me crunching numbers my god Jesus <laughs> Boring as uh, <laughs> the day is long, but uh, so after you know switching my major from accounting into um, you know, nutrition and food science, really started getting into the nuts and bolts of it, and I competed for powerlifting uh, at, at the University of Texas, and kind of just you know went from there and uh, started following my passion uh, versus following something that to make money or whatever. Uh, I really just said, you know what, this is my passion. I'm going to try to build a business out of my hobby, and that's what I was fortunate enough and blessed to do. Now, I know, again, growing up in the Houston community, your name was synonymous with Mr. T Texas. So was that a competition that you entered in, in college? Yeah, actually, right, uh, right in college, I entered that. I won the Texas State Championships. And, you know, my dad still introduces me as Mr. Texas, embarrassingly enough. <laughs> I told dad, I go, you know, dad, that was 100 years ago, but yeah, that's fine. So he'll still introduce me to women, children, old men. He'll say, this is my son, Mr. Texas, you know, so kind of embarrassing. But, uh, yeah, so I did. I was fortunate enough to do that. And then I uh, went to the USA Championships, went to Nationals, thinking I was a big shot. 
but unfortunately, I was a natural athlete. I did not take steroids, <laughs> and I realized at the national level it was a little different, different, uh, different uh, level uh, of right. that. So I decided to get out of the sport uh, and really focus on my business. Okay, so picking up from that point, so you graduate University of Texas, and then how do you go, sort of go directly into your business? Uh, I, I know you moved away for a little bit. Yeah, actually, well, I started off at EAS, uh, which is a big sports nutrition company. Yeah. Um, we were fortunate enough to uh, do product development for them. I was writing for their magazine. They had a, a fitness magazine called Muscle Media. Uh, I got a high exposure to the industry right away as a young young lad back <laughs> a long time ago. But uh, so, and actually what's interesting is they actually were working with the Denver Broncos at the time, and they happened to win the Super Bowl the two years that we were working with them. So I got to meet athletes, and we, we had premieres for uh, – they filmed a movie called Body of Work, which is a documentary on body transformation. Uh, they had a premiere, and I was actually in the movie and uh, as a judge for one of the contests. And so I got exposure to athletes, to celebrities, to a lot of people in that realm, and uh, it kind of, you know, as I say, the rest is uh, history. So then I know your business uh, takes you from Denver to Florida and then yeah, to I California. Started, yeah, actually, I worked for a year um, at Rexall Sundown. A company that was a sort of a, a really large uh, product development and uh, nutritional supplement firm. So I started developing products for them. And again, the whole thing is, man, I just I, I just I knew that my goal has always been to change the world one body at a time. So I was like, you know what? That's what I'm passionate about. So if I go to Florida to change people to help people, I'll do that. And in Florida, what I did is I developed products to help people. And then I moved to California with a company called Body Logics, which was a sort of trainers focused company and they, they sort of said, Hey, listen, look, we know you, you can do products and we know, you know, nutrition. So here's carte blanche. I want you to develop the baddest products you ever, the industry's ever seen. And I kind of did that. And, um, you know, I came out to California for that and, and started meeting more people here. And, you know, it's interesting because people, when they come to California, they're like, wow, LA, you got to know people, you know, you got to have connections and contacts and, you know, to get, I had no contacts. I had like literally, I didn't know anybody, <laughs> maybe two people. Right. <laughs> and, uh, so, it was it was interesting because I always tell the kids I talk to around the, around the world now uh, I tell them that listen sometimes you got to create your own breaks you know what I mean and that's kind of what happened is I really my, you know my parents aren't from wealth I didn't have connections I didn't have people kind of helping me I just kind of you know by the grace of God really just got put in a good position and uh, really you know sacrificed some stuff to just following my dream and following my passions and that's kind of what happened when I came to California. Well, wh what were some of those sacrifices? Uh, basically, you know, a lot of my friends were going out on Friday nights. Uh, they were hanging out a lot. They were, and what, what I was doing on Friday nights, on Saturday nights, was researching, you know, science and mm -hmm. looking at studies and talking to researchers around the world and saying, hey, what can we do now to get that eighth pack? You know what I mean? How do we get that that tenth pack out? You know, what do we do for abs? And how do you how you how do how does muscle really build? And how do you get health? And is cholesterol really you know necessary to test? Is it really inflammation or what's new? And late, I was always on the cutting edge. And it's interesting because in the ni late 90s, I started writing for magazines, and I used to write about a lot of nutrients and ingredients that were very cutting edge. No one heard of them. But now, 10, 15 years later, everybody has them in all their products. They're very common ingredients. So I, I feel glad that I was, I was on the cutting edge uh, before that. So those kind of sacrifices, um, I had kids when I was you know, at a young age. So really, I had to you know, take care of them. And you know, they came first always, and uh, my family. So you know, it was one of those things where – uh, the sacrifices, as you know, as parents that uh, you have to make uh, for your children first uh, and then also, you know, um, hustling really in a lot of ways hmm. and uh, not going out, really focusing on the business and family. That's it. Basically, that was my life. When, when you talk about about uh, the work that you've done and everything, I, I'm, I'm curious about how, how you apply your faith towards that, you know, in, in terms of specifically I'm thinking about, uh, you know, I mean, you, you fast during Ramadan and, you know, uh, you're exercising and you're doing all this stuff. And, and I know, you know, there's a tendency for, for certainly many Muslims to say, well, you shouldn't, you should take it easy during Ramadan. And I know just having spoken with you before, you, uh, you say no, you know, uh, be active, that's, do stuff. That's the secret of my success, my faith. My spirituality is the secret of my success because my spirituality determines reality. And that's <laughs> what it boils down to is when you have inner strength and, you know, listen, when you come from nothing, it, this is all bonus. That's the way I look at it. So to me, I've really uh, – all the dreams I had as a kid, I've already surpassed those dreams. I never mm -hmm. thought I would be in the position that I was in by God's grace. So I know that having faith, praying, and having you know, powerful you know, uh, fortitude inside uh, can allow you to achieve anything in life, really. I mean if you look at you know, where I came from, and Pervez knows where I grew up, 
and you know where I came from and the challenges and the struggles and all those things and to see where you know the little bit I've done a little bit um, you know from that point is really it's by God's mercy really that's what it boils down to and, and that's kind of the quote that Winston Churchill once said and I live by is that he said that success is not final failure is not fatal it's the courage to continue that counts and that's what kind of, I kind of you know go by is that I just keep going no matter what you know challenges ups and downs smiles and frowns you just got to keep going on so as Pervez alluded to earlier in the episode, I mean, uh, this is this is New Year season and this is this is the time when everybody starts saying, all right, this is the year that I get into shape. This is the year that that, uh, you know, I, I become who I want to be. So now you've been doing this a little while. What what are uh, some of the pitfalls uh, that people can avoid and what are some of the, the lessons that uh, you've learned as as you've uh, helped people uh, get into shape and uh, for that matter what are the things that pe- that you know in advance okay this person it's not going to work out for them because they have the wrong attitude uh, well, what, what, well first thing I'll say is that the number one New Year's resolution for the past 20 plus years has been weight loss that is hmm. the number one always New Year's resolution and really, uh, in, in 20 years of doing it, working with thousands of people, seeing people change in, in all areas of life from, you know, 15 to 80 years old, um, uh, one thing I know for sure is that anyone can do it. No matter hmm. what excuse you have, what circumstances you're under, what resolutions you make. And I always tell people, don't resolute, execute. And hmm. that's the secret. Is resolutions are only one step, right? But the secrets of New Year's resolution are three. Number one, you have to have a firm deadline. Right with work or anything else, if you don't have a deadline, you're going to be spinning your wheels. You have to have a drop dead April 12th deadline or March 15th or whatever it is. Generally, if it's an event or something that has some more positive pressure on you, that would help. So that's number mm-hmm. one, hard deadline. Number two, you have to set specific goals. I'll be surprised how many people just say, "Hey, I just want to look better." Well, that's not mm-hmm. really a goal. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. It's like saying, "Hey, I want to do good at work." Well, what does that mean? What's tangible? You know. So mm-hmm. what you have to do is I always tell people write down your specific goals exact not 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 general not broad but hey i want to drop you know 11 and a half pounds of body fat i want to increase my bench press 52 pounds or whatever it may be but be mm-hmm. very specific very you know very 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 uh focused on that uh goal and really you know set three or four really specific goals and then measure those goals and follow through with those goals on that deadline and the third thing i'd recommend to have new year's resolution solution as they say is uh <laughs> always have a positive environment to achieve those goals. In other words, don't surround yourself with haters. <laughs> don't surround yourself with people that are negative. They're going to bring you down and, and, and say, why are you doing that? Are you eating chicken? And come on, brown rice, really? But white rice tastes so much better. Damn, I love cheese, man. Why are you going to not eat cheese? You know, all those kind of things. Surround yourself with positive, forward-thinking people who are doing it with you. I recommend you know, getting a partner in crime, definitely. You know, whether it's your wife, your significant other, uh, your children, whoever it is, your brother, friends, get a group of people and do it together. Because when you have unity, the, the power of the jamaat, we say, right? When you have the jamaat working together toward a single goal, you motivate each other. And one thing I do every year privately is I run a body transformation contest. And yeah. what that is, is basically a, a group of people who say, listen, here's some goals we have and we race. It's a race. We compete against each other to see who can do the best, who can achieve the best body, who can make the most change. And we look at before and after photos, body fat testing. And you know what? You're, I always tell people, if you're running a race, you're always going to run faster if there's a guy next to you racing you. You know what I mean? Hmm. Versus running alone. So you know what? We, we make it a competitive, a healthy, competitive, positive environment. And I think if you do those three things, you can really uh, not just resolute, but you can actually achieve. Uh, those New Year's resolutions. So taking on the issue of weight loss, as you said, the number one New Year's resolution for the last 20 years has been people wanting to lose weight. You know, they say the three new magic words are no longer I love you. It's uh, you, uh, you've lost weight. <laughs> so so with, re- with regards to that in particular, I mean, we live in an age where there's, you know, the diet industry is huge. And you've got so many different diets and you've got, uh, you know, supplement-based diets and whatnot. So what do you really recommend for weight loss specifically? Well, I mean, flattery will get you everywhere, first of all. And, <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, I would, I would recommend my book. My book is The Six-Pack Diet Plan. And I really don't think of it as – see, the number one problem we have, honestly, is weight loss, the word weight. That is the number one problem. 
really you got to focus on fat loss. That's more important because weight could be bone, could be water weight, could be muscle, which is all unhealthy ways to lose weight. Like if I, right. you know what? I, the, the funniest thing is people come in and tell me, hey, listen, you know, these, these sort of actresses or people who are, need to get ready for shoots are like, oh my God, I got to lose 10 pounds in a week. You know, and I say, well, which arm? I say, excuse me? I say, which arm? <laughs> which arm do you want me to cut off? Because that's, the, <laughs> you're going to lose 10 pounds in a week. You know what I mean? Like, it's, just, that's not, <laughs> that's right. it's not reasonable. But, um, but, uh, but basically going back to the point of, you know, what diet works. And I really, I really feel sorry for consumers out there, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you Google or if you, you're bombarded with, you know, paleo and South Beach and Atkins and what, you know, there's so many vegan and not vegan. And there's so many different things out there. I always tell people, listen, number one, do a diet that you can stick to consistently. Number one. Mm-hmm. Okay, a diet that you can actually incorporate into your lifestyle to where it's like, you know what, I can do it. Uh, uh, one that's realistic, right? If you eat meat all your life, you're not going to become a vegan, you know, a person the day, a- the day after tomorrow. You're not. It's just not going to – over time, you're going to hate it, right? Hmm. So you got – in other words, work your way into it slowly, right? If you're going to try something new, work your way into it slowly. Now, if you are lacto-ovo, vegetarian, you might say, hey, listen, let me go vegan. Let me try vegan. That's reasonable, Right? But uh, do things that are reasonable, do things that are realistic is very important. And, and also, the always consistent persistence. That is the key to any successful diet, consistent persistence. What that means is, you know what? Hey, if I fall off the horse, I'm going to jump right back on. What happens is people get on a diet, they see results, they go out to their friend's birthday party, have a little cake, and then feel horrible in the morning and like, ah, throw their hands in the air, right? That's and right. we give up. We give back up, to right? zero. Back to zero. And that's what I tell people. It's like, and by the way, that's not really a part of our spiritual nature is to, you know, despair, right? We never despair. So I say, don't despair. Get right back on that horse once again and start the diet the next morning. Get cardio going and, uh, you know, get stay on track. And if people do that, I think whatever diet you choose, you know, I think you can have success in it as long as it's not harmful to you and you are getting results in a healthy way and a long term way. And you're not trying to get a quick fix. Now, can you talk a little bit about your your work? Obviously, um, and I, I want to circle back around to to the books that you've worked on and the books that you've written. But uh, you know, you you've obviously gained enough of a reputation being down there in SoCal that uh, a lot of fairly well known personalities have turned to you as uh, to be kind of a guru for them. Can can you can you tell the audience how how that started for you? Um, actually, that's uh, really the most interesting part of my profession. And uh, one I do enjoy because it really allows me to, you know, work with some of the most elite people and their, their work is shown on the big screen. So uh, no pressure, of course, right? <laughs> you can pay $25 million for a movie and, you know, that's a topless scene. So no pressure on me at all. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, how I got started in it, my first major client was uh, Sly Stallone, actually. And okay. Sly has been a good friend of ours for many, many years. And, you know, he was my first uh, major client, I would say. Uh, and then I, you know, from there he referred me to many, many people and we started working on the movies and, uh, you know, Rocky and Rambo. And he always, you know, I always joke with him that, uh, you know, when he was making another Rambo, another Rocky, I go, God, what are you going to fight in this one? Heart disease? Arthritis? <laughs> Jesus. Oh my God. I mean, the guy looks incredible. He's Senility. years old and then looks in amazing shape. So he was kind of the first guy that introduced me to people. Really one of the nicest guys on earth, I think. Really just a, a, a true guy who really gets it. Uh, so to speak, and really falls through with everything, trains intensely, goes through injuries. Uh, uh, you know, really, he is a real-life Rocky story, you know, so mm-hmm. to speak, an extreme motivation, motivating individual. And again, a lot of these clients, what's cool is a lot of these clients have, you know, a vested interest to follow the plan, to have success, because if they fail, millions of people are going to see them on screen. So, yeah. you know, if you're getting paid $20 million for a movie, you got to be in shape. you gotta eat the, you got to eat that chicken breast and egg whites. you got to, you know, get that workout in. You can't have bad days, right? So, right. for example, I was working with Bruce Willis uh, for Die Hard 4, and he had a top of scene, one, you know, one scene. So the director's like, listen, we, we're going to shoot this on this date, and, it, you know, he's got to be ready. So I was like, oh, my God, wow, no pressure at all. Really, uh, you know, the hmm. Die Hard uh, movie set is relying on him looking good that one day for that one hour. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. so I worked with him, and he, he looked great. I mean, he looked great. And uh, once you figure out the, the, the sort of system and the way I do it with those individuals and any individual is customization. You know, Zucky, mm-hmm. you're not the same as Pervez. Pervez, you're not the same as me. You, uh, you know, your wife's not the same as, you know, another lady. Or So everybody, I say everybody, is different. Mm-hmm. So especially with um, high-level individuals uh, like actors or entertainers or movie stars who rely on their body sort of for the business, uh, you know, I make sure I did do blood work, 
tons of blood work. I do DNA testing. I do, I mean, extensive urine analysis. I do so much stuff to where I really get a roadmap of where you're at, a blueprint, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And that, that blueprint, I'm like, okay, I just fix everything that's wrong with you through supplementation, through proper diet, and, of course, training as well. So, I mean, you've been working with Stallone for how long now? Almost 10 years. Yeah, See, I mean, th- th- that to me is fascinating because, I mean, Stallone, basically, since the time his career started, has been known as, you know, the fitness guy, you know? So I, I think what I find fascinating about that is that even he was like, I still need help. Absolutely. And he actually, it's funny, he left me a message and he uh, called me about, uh, about Rambo, and that's exactly what he said to me. He goes, Ray, I need, to give me, I need you to give me a call. I'm getting ready for Rambo. I need your help here, buddy. You know, wow. so that's kind of with you know, with his boy. Here we are. Oh, give me a call. Fly. So, what what was uh, what was the first film that uh, you worked with him on? Uh, Rocky. Uh, oh, the, not the, latest, the latest, the latest Rocky for, for the for the last Rocky. Yeah, the the latest Rocky, and then Rambo, and then all the other ones that came along now, and the, the latest oh. ones, Grudge Match, which you guys got to go see. It's a great movie. Yeah. Uh, you know, the guy again. When you get older, you need more help because if you're he's sixty seven years old. Right. I mean, the guy is sixty seven years old. And right. Think about that. I mean, think about the other sixty seven year olds you know. I mean, they don't have ripped abs and muscles and veins. And I mean, he's right. coming out with Expendables 3. You know what I yeah, mean? Right. He's still filming. He's still doing it big. He and my dad share the exact same birthday. Wow. July 6, 1946. Amazing. Amazing. And George Bush Jr. <laughs> wow. Now, now, the the common, uh, you know, when somebody looks at somebody like Stallone or any of these guys, especially lately when you, I would say certainly in the past 10 years, uh, people have gotten massive to such a degree that obviously people start talking about enhancement and, and uh, uh, performance enhancing drugs, etc. And I figure there's no one better equipped to address uh, uh, the whether those are being used or how, why they shouldn't be used than you. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Um, generally, you know, look, it's always – as long as – I always tell people, as long as there's a performance initiative, as long as uh, there's a public pressure to look a certain way, that is always going to be out there. Mm-hmm. Now, it's up, to your, it's up to you whether you choose to take it or not. And, you know, is it prevalent? Yeah, it, it might be. It might not be. It's not, it's not, that's not my business, to be honest right. with you. That, that, I have no concern with that. Uh, my business is to, you know, use uh, the customization programs I have to uh, use the proper food and supplements. And sometimes I'll custom make supplements for the individuals because nothing's available in the market that addresses their specific needs. So that's kind of what I deal with, mainly. And I leave the rest to the doctors or whoever else, you know, if they're working with anybody else. I, I really don't kind of uh, deal with that. Now, there, there, was a, there was a documentary, I think, in 2008, right? It was called Bigger, Stronger, Faster. Yes, yes, great that documentary. Did. That's actually a great documentary. If you want to know about that subject, that's one of the best documentaries out there for that. Now, uh, your, your current client, or one of your current clients, is, of yeah, course... Yeah, we got to geek out for a moment. Yeah, so so let, let me let me preface this for the audience. Pervez and I are both uh, huge dorks. Uh, so so really, this entire really this entire show, even right. the three episodes before this, have really just been <laughs> an elaborate uh, charade to get Rehan to come on and talk about how uh, he is training Batman. That's what we call him. <laughs> Batflick. So, so uh, Rehan, you got you got to tell us about this. So, so Ben Affleck, Ben Affleck has been cast as as the new Batman, and uh, you you've been training him since uh, the town, I believe. I've been training him for I've been working with him for about eight years now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And one of the best people I've ever met. Really, uh, it's it's an amazing thing. I know the world was shocked when the internet uh, exploded, but I knew about it before. Obviously, I was getting him ready beforehand. We've been kind of working on it for a while and uh, getting him ready for, for the biggest, pretty much the biggest roles of his career. And it's mm-hmm. funny because, you know, he was doing an interview and he was, um, you know, Warner Brothers sat him down for a meeting and said, listen, we're going to cast you as Batman, but listen, there might be some backlash. <laughs> you know, there's a sensitive, there's a sensitive matter that's There's right. a lot of geeks out there who love <laughs> this this character, and they're very sensitive, and they're very pro Christian Bale, and they're not going to want a change, and they, you might experience backlash. And back, you know, Ben's like, "Oh, come on, I've done, I did Geely. I mean, God, you know, I did, I can handle it all. I did, you know, I've uh, won the Oscar. Come on, I can do anything, whatever, you know, and right. I can handle it. I've, I've gone up, I've gone down. You know, it can't be that bad, whatever." So the news is announced. He goes to the internet. And the first comment he sees is, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so here's my question. Does he come yeah. to you and he's like, hey, man, 
I need I need help. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be putting that cape on. I I need to you know uh, I need to look good whether I'm wearing bat armor or not. Absolutely. And, and, uh, you know his his goal is to be the biggest baddest Batman that ever was, and I think he will be because he's the tallest and <laughs> he's got this frame and he's got the structure and you know what I think he's gonna really surprise a lot of people in that role and I think you're gonna all the haters out there on the in the internet are gonna be really pleasantly surprised uh, I think at his role. Uh, in that movie, and I think he's really, really, I mean, he's extremely committed to his fitness. Uh, you know, he does it also for health, so he wants to do it in a healthy way as well because he has kids, and he's really a family man, really nice guy. So, you know, yeah. he wants to do it uh, and, and commit to it and really show people that, hey, listen, I, I, I'm taking this role very seriously, and I'm going to come on screen, you know, big, lean, as muscular as Batman can possibly be. Right. So r- r- real quick, um, and this kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier with regards to uh, body specific uh, programs. But in the case of, like, say, Ben Affleck, for example, how would you approach his fitness goals for, say, the town versus the same guy but now wanting to do Batman? It, you know what? It, it's, it varies a little bit. Again, it's, uh, that's a great point you make because it is all goal-oriented, right? Right. If anybody comes to you, it's got to be based on what their uh, expected results are. So if they, for example, in the town, he wanted to be ripped, lean right. for that one scene where he had abs, he looked fantastic. Um, you know, there was a little bit of a different program. It was more focused on leanness. That's whereas right. in Batman, it's more focused on size, muscle, just, just you know, and leanness, but uh, just more muscle. You know, so there's a little bit uh, change in, you know, calories and protein amount. And, you know, you have to modify some of the supplements. But, you know, you definitely it, – it's always geared toward the end goal, always. I mean, there's no time where I will just, you know, give them a generic program. That, that's never the case. I mean, it's always going to be blood work. It's always going to be, you know, customization. It's always going to be goal-oriented. And, you know, and then, and then you know, the, the cool part is he actually follows through. He's one of those guys that, you know, really is dedicated and he wants to see results, really. That's right. Well, whatever you're doing with him is working because I read an article recently about how he's getting too big and his <laughs> present roles are a little concerned. Yeah, David, David Fincher hates me right now. But, uh, David Fincher, that's that right. Later. But uh, no, um, he's making a David Fincher movie right now and uh, he was extremely huge for it. Um, but uh, you know what? Hey, I told Ben, I go, that's a good problem to have. Right. So, okay. So, so, that, so that's, kind of, that's kind of obviously, uh, uh, is, you know, Somebody preparing for a role, you know, we're talking about Ben Affleck as Batman. Obviously, he's going to have a very specific kind of regiment. Uh, what, what about everyday people? Like, so what, what can I do in an, you know, in an achievable way where just I'm not necessarily looking to get ripped. I'm just looking to be in in decent shape right now. Right now, I mean, you know, I, I feel comfortable with you and our audience to say I'm I'm horribly out of shape. <laughs> I'm, Come on, dude, show I, us the guns. Show us the guns. I, I I choose not to do that, but I'm I'm like 35 going on 60 right now, right? <laughs> so 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 I I ask you, you know, as as just an everyday guy, what can I do in 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 achievable steps to have you know just a better quality of living? Let's say. Really, there's there's some simple tips I can give to people, and, and really that will change your life. I'll tell mm-hmm. you right now. Uh, one, number one, it's, 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 it's to me the most simplest fat loss, health enhancing, anabolic, everything tip of all time is drink more pure water. Drinking mm. more pure water can literally turn around your health tremendously. Number one, your body is, you know, over 60% water, your muscles 70%, and you have so many functions <clears throat> in your body are reliant on hydration. Most people are actually dehydrated. I actually test individuals on a body scale that actually measures body hydration, most people are dehydrated. And what that does, it lowers your metabolism. It causes so many catabolic effects. Um, it stops you from losing weight. I can have brain you know, issues. I mean, you have so many things that can occur. In fact, uh, it's very important to drink water before you sleep. When you mentioned health, that actually mm-hmm. showed that um, dehydration uh, before sleep actually increases your risk of morning heart attack. So just drinking water before you sleep can help so, you know, not, uh, you know, maybe have issues with um, morning heart attacks, according to some research. So, um, you know, just drinking more water. And I think most people can do that. I'm not talking about fluid. The big mm-hmm. difference between fluid and water. I'm not talking about fluid. I'm not talking about, you know, calorie-filled juices that will, you know, give your uh, the, the, the belly to increase. <laughs> we don't want those uh, sugar-filled juices. We want to drink pure water. That's number one. Number two, never overeat. I mean, follow the prophetic tradition. 
you know, one third water, one third food, one third air. I mean, really, that to me is the greatest health advice ever given. You know, eat and drink, but don't be excessive. Uh, if you don't overeat so many, in fact, the National Institute of Health says that over 90% of diseases are linked directly to diet. And a lot of that is from overeating, it is just, you know, gluttony, is overeating. And that, in fact, what's interesting is that a lot of people confuse hunger for thirst, actually. So you're really actually thirsty, but not your bite, your mind, you have these hormones that turn on and these signaling mechanisms. Your body is very complex. And appetite is an extremely complex thing. I wrote a whole article about it, just appetite control hormones, which we, which we've discovered. We don't even know some of the ones that are, aren't even discovered yet in your body. I mean, you're actually, it, it, there's actually research that shows your stomach talks to your brain and actually has signaling hmm. pathways that helps control food intake. So, you know, to, to ma- maximize that, don't overeat. Simplest thing ever. Never, ever, ever. A human being should never eat till they're full. Hmm. That's what I talk about. A human being should never eat till they're completely full. Should be about half full at the most and then move on. And then well, eat frequent small meals. What's, I mean, going back to water, what's, what, what's a recommended yeah. amount Daily of water? Intake. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for women, I would say a minimum of 64 ounces a day, which is about half a gallon. And for mm-hmm. men, about 80 to 90 ounces a day, which is not that unreasonable. I mean, yeah, you might have to go to the bathroom more, but your urine should actually be clear. If your urine is not clear, that means mm-hmm. you're clearly not drinking enough water. That's right. That's wow. Right. And for men, uh, the color of urine also, you know, for like kidney stones and things like Absolutely. that. All stones, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's so many. Uh, a lot of the new research I'm working on, I don't want to get too technical or biochemical on you, but um, a lot of the stuff I'm looking at now is DNA research, is, you know, modifying genes and, and, and testing your genes and what you're predisposed to and blocking certain predispositions you have genetically and modifying oh. your genes so you can actually have a better outcome than what your parents kind of gave you. So does that. Does that relate to uh, if you have a genetic history of heart disease, diabetes? Absolutely. We can actually, we can actually counter all of that now through proper nutrition, exercise, and uh, wow. the right supplementation. Yeah, because um, people almost uh, think that's like, you know, they're just, de- you know, predisposed to those conditions just because their parents had it. That's completely untrue. Actually, now you can, you can mm-hmm. overcome any obstacles. I mean, my genes are to be about 135 pounds with a little bit of a gut. I mean, that's, that's skinny legs, skinny arms. That's, that's you my just described so, me. Yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> but you're the good lean. But uh, I, I was a skinny fat lean. You know hmm. what I mean? So, and that's, that's a big condition nowadays. Is, is, is There's a condition called skinny fat where you see skinny yeah. individuals yeah. who have, you know, are predisposed to heart disease. I mean, they're having that's heart right. attacks. People, hmm. you look at them, they're skinny, but they're had, holding a lot of organ fat, a lot of fat around their organs, a lot of internal fat uh, that you can't see externally. But they're having heart problems and all these things. In fact, Absolutely. I mean, the situation is getting like code red, man. I mean, you've got kids that are taking Lipitor. I mean, I know hmm. an 18 year old kid who's taking Lipitor. I mean, can you imagine? Wow. You know, I really want to talk about the health issues that um, confront the Muslim community. But before I go there, I wanted to kind of uh, also go back to something you brought on or, or talked about earlier with regards to the various fad diets and, and whatnot out there. And just from a personal interest point of view, uh, we, we talked about documentaries. There was another documentary that sort of created some uh, waves, and that was, um, I think it was called Forks Over Knives. Yes. Probably. And it started this whole sort of vegan movement and the China study. Any thoughts on that? Because, uh, you know, another thing that we find in Muslim tradition is that, uh, and, and contrary to what a lot of Muslims think, is that meat should be eaten in small amounts. Yeah, I, w- I would say I would say that. I mean, I, I think any diet I think that excludes a certain major food group, I think is problematic, in my personal opinion, uh, and on the research. Uh, I think you should never exclude a major food group, uh, but that doesn't mean you have to overeat it. <laughs> you know what I right. Mean? I think hmm. the key is always moderation is the key. I mean, I think we're, we're, the, the key with any kind of diet, any way, uh, just don't be extreme. You know, we're not extreme. We, we're moderate people, right? So we, we follow right. the moderate way, which is, hey, you know what? If you're going to eat meat, don't eat 10 pounds of steak. I mean, you know what I mean? Have a, have a small a small amount of beef, small amount of chicken, fish, you know. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of hype about that, and the, the documentaries make a valid point in a lot of ways. And it, for some people, the vegan diet is the way to go. I have many clients who are vegan and who are vegetarian, which is great for them. It works for them. So, again, it's based on your personal, you know, goals and your personal needs. Um, as far as health benefits, I could argue both sides. To be honest with you, I could present studies that show that beef is not harmful. 
I can show many studies that show the beef is actually good for you. I, I can show the other studies which show the beef is harmful for you. So right. I think the key is, again, moderation, what works for you, what fits in your lifestyle. And at the end of the day, really, guys, what it boils down to is results, results, results. I always tell people, I'm not in the fitness business. I'm in the results business. Right. But if you don't get, you know, don't confuse hard work for results. Um, <laughs> and another quote that I've heard you say is that abs are made in the kitchen, not in the gym. Absolutely. Would you say Absolutely. that by analogy, that goes to overall health and fitness? I would say – 70% any, diet. I would say even more. I would say not, the new research more and more is showing over 75 to 80%, I would say, is diet-related. Uh, wow. And the reason I say that is because you can't out-train a poor diet. You know, there's just <laughs> no way. Nicely not said. Gonna be, you're not gonna, it's going to be unable to do that. So what you got to do is really, uh, number one, commit to it seriously. Uh, number two is follow some plan. You know what I mean? You have to have a roadmap. You have to have a guide. If you you get in your car and just start driving around aimlessly, no, you have to have a destination. You have to have guide. You have to have a GPS, a sort of nutritional GPS, which means, hey, here are some things I'm going to follow. and I'm going to try it out. And if it works, great. If not, no, I won't do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, based on most of the research, um, you know, there's really a lot of tricks you can do to trick your body. But mainly, I think some of the lifestyle things you can do is, again, don't overeat, drink more water, you know, do cardio in the morning, uh, you know, eat mixed meals, uh, eat high amounts of fiber during the day, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, vegetables, kale, spinach, sort of superfoods, dates, figs, olives. You know, these are some of the power foods you should incorporate into your diet every single day to, again, enhance health and have so many different, you know, effects in your body. For example, I mean, almonds have a, uh, a compound in them called amygdalin. Amygdalin actually has been shown to lower cancer risk. So, you know, foods can be really, really powerful. And incorporating right. some of these power foods every day, um, you know, can really help your health and wellness. And people say, well, is it just for fitness or leanness? No, it actually is for health. I mean, for example, right. dates have something in there called beta-D-glucan. Beta-D-glucan is a very powerful soluble fiber that actually enhances digestive health. So your stomach is better. So you can absorb more nutrients. So, I mean, dates, you know, are a very powerful food. So incorporating those foods daily uh, can certainly help your health and well-being. How about the um, whole – sorry, Zaki, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, like the – when when you, when you talks about diet, how much of it is calorie counting versus quality food training? Great question, man. You guys are just knocking them out of the ballpark today. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Actually, one of the best questions I get. And, and most people are, are counting points and calories and yeah. everything. Number, they're based on numbers, right? They're the TV show. That's right. <laughs> but uh, really, I, I don't believe in that. I believe in macronutrient density, which means uh, I think calories are overrated. And because you know why? A calorie is not a calorie. In other words, right. every calorie, not all calories are the same. Absolutely. All cal calories are not created equal. I mean, you're, <laughs> for example, there's essential fats which modify hormones, which can help you metabolize uh, nutrients faster and other things and, and increase metabolism. Um, there's, you know, protein has a thermic effect, which means it causes you, you require more energy to digest protein versus carbs. So, you know, those foods have different effects in your body. And so calories, you know, I, I always tell people, I thought, really? If you think a calorie is a calorie, okay, I want you to eat 1,000 calories in Snickers every day, and I'll eat 1,000 calories of lean protein and good carbs. And let's see in, in 30 days who's fit. There you go. I mean, it, just, it just doesn't make sense. A calorie is not a calorie. So at the end of the day, it's about macronutrient ratio. It's about protein, carbohydrate, essential fats. It's about balance. It's about fiber. And really, it's about putting it all together into a system that's consistent, that's doable, and attainable goals. So uh, given, given what you're just talking about, what would you say are just the foods you must avoid? Stay away. <laughs> do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Avoid at all costs. Man, you, you, you won't need to collect $200 if you pass these foods up. Jeez. You're going to need a couch <laughs> and, a, and a nap because <laughs> they're going to fill you up. Um, I think French fries are horrible for you. I think French fries uh, contra contain a chemical called acrylamide. Acrylamide <laughs> is also found in cigarette smoke. <laughs> if you can believe it. Oh, so wow. The same chemical that's in cigarette smoke, you're actually ingesting when you take French fries. So, so not I white potatoes more... necessarily, though. Huh? Not white potatoes. You're no, no. French fries. Yeah, French fries because they're deep fried, and it's actually the, the deep frying is a concern. So anything mm. deep fried, you're going to have to try to avoid if possible because it's just the chemical toxins uh, to your body. A cheesecake is one of the worst foods on earth because it contains <laughs> fat and sugar. Um, you know, uh, pot pies, chicken pot pie mm. might be the most unhealthiest thing on earth. It sounds like it's healthy because you got chicken, mm. 
somebody trying to make that argument, but it has chicken. <laughs> I go, yes, but you can't sprinkle chicken in fat. I mean, it's just, you know, it's sodium, uh, those kind of things. Uh, but there's also a lot of hidden foods that have uh, very detrimental effects on your health. For example, uh, some of these epic salads that you can eat out at yeah. restaurants. Uh, there, you know, some salads can be 3,000 calories, you know, with the guacamole and the nachos and the cheese and all those things. So um, one other quick tip I'll mention to you on a side note is, if you really want to get healthy, like if you're serious about it and you want to get real lean, I would never eat out. That's right. I, I was I just going to say. I would, I would, I would, I would, if I didn't make it, I wouldn't eat it. That's Something really- I quote you as once you told me a while back was that anytime you eat out, you should average like you're eating a stick of butter. Is that is that reasonable? I, that, that's about that's about reasonable because your their idea of healthy is not your idea of healthy. That's right. So when I go to a restaurant, I say, listen, I, I don't want butter. I don't want oil. I don't want salt. They say, okay, I, I mean, they always put butter. They always put, they, we, we got to cook it, you know, yeah. that's just a little bit, you know. That's right. But again, now I've, now what I'm telling them is if I do happen to eat out, I'll say, listen, I'm allergic to salt and, and oil and butter. If I have my food, I'll have to go to the ER. So then they wow. take it seriously. Right. <laughs> hey, so, when we were talking about foods to avoid, uh, for the listening audience here, let's be uh, equal opportunity haters here. How about Indian, Pakistani food, Arab food, anything uh, in that you know cuisine that you'd avoid? My God, I mean, really, I mean, anything, I just, I have, a, I have a simple philosophy. If you can see your reflection in the food, try not to eat it. So, <laughs> <laughs> some of these uh, sort of curries and salons and greasy, oily foods where you can actually see a reflection in the food, I would try to avoid. Uh, I would try to avoid. I think, I think this food and South Asian and Indian food is one of the health, unhealthiest on earth. I, I, really? believe, I believe it's just full of carbs. That's right. Full of the worst kind of fats. And you know what? They're, unfortunately, the results of that food, you're, it's, it's showing in the community. Our, our rate of diabetes is epic. Our rate of coronary heart disease is epic. I mean, how many of you guys know some uncle or auntie who has heart disease or diabetes Absolutely. or, or all of the above? You know what I mean? That's no, Rehan, I want to devote a whole segment of the show to really talk about that. But before we get away from the specific foods, can you talk about oil? Yeah, absolutely. Good oil versus bad oil, because that's a big <laughs> issue. It is a big issue, and the, the problem with oil is canola oil, all this sunflower oil, all these oils. Once you heat it, that's it, it right. Extreme, Even olive oil. Absolutely. Once you once you apply high degrees of heat to it, you actually kill a lot of the healthy properties of it. So, but it, it, and you start releasing certain chemicals and mm-hmm. other things that make that oil actually toxic to your to your body, um, and actually harmful to your body over long term. And that's what we're seeing now. And so, what I always recommend is if you're going to cook in olive oil, yeah. and sprinkle olive oil on the food afterwards. You know, that way you have... The, How the about cooking oil. oil? Not deep frying, because obviously, like you said, deep frying anything yes. is bad as a general yes. rule. But uh, if you're going to use oil for cooking, i.e. heating, I've heard, for example, peanut oil is better. Is that true? Um, that, I, I would say I would say some, some oils are more stable. Um, okay. There's an oil called Innova, which is from Japan, which is actually one of the best oils. that actually can take the heat. Uh, but most oils, I mean, even peanut oil, most of the oils... Can't right. tolerate heat, you know. Uh, uh, one good oil that that ha- that's showing some benefits is coconut oil. Coconut oil has some benefits even under heat, uh, so you may want to try that uh, or take it, uh, you know, along with food. But it, it's shown to have some good benefits because it contains something called medium chain triglycerides, which help metabolism, health, and all those things. So, um, you know, coconut oil or the Anova oil may be your best bet for cooking. And then now uh, we've talked about oils. Um, another. Um, you know, big food ingredient out there and whatnot is sugar. Simple uh, sugar, and it's and it's, it's high fructose corn syrup as well. And it's all foods. What's, what's interesting is they have high fructose corn syrup in ketchup, in mustard, and other like condiments. I mean, it's in every single food. And what what it causes is something. It's causing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And what that is, it's called NAFLD. And what that is is. Basically, you would think that only alcoholics get, you know, hepatitis or liver disease or liver toxicity. But you're seeing people who eat like lots of fruit, um, who eat too overdo it on fruit, who, you know, sort of um, eat a lot of these uh, high fructose corn syrup and sugar actually are causing this sort of liver problem. In fact, a a new research has shown that over 60 percent of the population suffers from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I mean, think about that. Mm. And so six out of 10 people. and, And so... Uh, and people don't even know they have it because it's really extremely hard to test for. You can't test for it through a blood work. The only way you can really test for it is a liver biopsy, which means they got to take out a piece of your liver, which I don't think is very comfortable on a Monday afternoon. You know what I mean? So <laughs> most people have to keep parts of their liver inside. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. But uh, but but most people are suffering from that. What does that do? That causes you to stop. You know, it, it causes you to stop weight loss from occurring, fat loss from occurring. It causes you to have you know a lot of issues in terms of you know conversion of nutrients. Everything's processed in the liver, so a lot of toxins are increased. Your metabolism decreases. Um, any of those enzymes, energy levels go down. People have fatigue. A lot of people who have fatigue and say, "Man, I'm just tired all the time." It's because of this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's because of overdoing our fruit. A lot of people say, "Well, you know, fruit's good for you." But overdoing it again, excessive, right? Not right. being moderate, being excessive, eating eating something good as fruit can cause this sort of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and cause problems for you digesting and absorbing other nutrients. I mean, when you talk about high fructose corn syrup, uh, could you touch on you know processed foods in general? I mean, the uh, general approach I take is if you have to open a box to eat something, it's probably best to avoid that. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the new trend. Or a bag. Of- yeah, the new trend is packaged foods are, are causing a lot of problems. In fact, it's even worse for our kids because they're bombarded with the marketing and the advertising. Right. And whatever you do at your house, you can't do other people's houses, unfortunately. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, but uh, I think it's just, again, it's about moderation and increasing activity. You know, you got to make sure you exercise regularly, uh, especially weight training. Uh, a lot of people cardiocize themselves to death, but weight training is really important for bone density, uh, for heart health, a lot of different things. So I think weight training is critical. And again, it's really hard to out-train a poor diet, so you really got to be careful with packaged foods. You got to be careful with, you know, read labels, research. I mean, th- think about this. These are foods you're ingesting into your body, and you know, health as well. You know what I mean? That's what Gandhi said, right? Gandhi said, you know, it's, it's not pieces of gold and silver. It's health that's the true and real wealth, mm-hmm. right? Because if you don't have it, see what happens. You know, look at people that don't have health. Man, they would trade the world for it, right? They would pay whatever. Steve Jobs paid whatever he could to help his health issues, right? So and it and it uh, ended up unfortunately, but um, health is the critical factor. So I think that's you know kind of the key is to avoid those sort of packaged foods. Go for natural foods, and you know what they, people say they're too expensive, but you can find ways to make them economical. I know you got to go into Whole Foods and you know take out a mortgage to try to get the next meal. Whole paycheck. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, there are economical foods, and you know companies like Trader Joe's and Mother's Market and other other sort of you know sprouts are doing a good job of create economical, organic, and healthy foods. That's right. And especially for those of us living in California, we have a lot of available, uh, you know, markets and so on. Absolutely. Yeah, that, absolutely. And again, you know, there's a, there's a big shift now in uh, food quality, organics. But again, you have to remember there's, there's, there's organizations that are extremely large and have lots of dollars, and they're not going to, you know, go, go down swinging. I mean, there's That's commercials right. that say – there's commercials that show why corn is beneficial. You know, yeah. and corn sugar and high fructose corn syrup can actually is not detrimental. You know yeah. what? I teach doctors all the time, and the questions they ask me in the seminars are kind of scary. There you, you know? go. And I, go. just on a side note, I'll tell you when I was when I, I, I I'm the good fortune of speaking around the world. I'm doing a seminar in London February 1st as well. But when I do these training courses or these sort of keynote speak speaking engagements all around the world, and um, one interesting, I know we touched on the celebrity part of my business earlier. But people forget that I'm actually more of a scientist than that. So I was giving a seminar in Italy. Uh, it was an, a, a two-day class, eight hours each day, intensive biochemistry, nutrition, food science. I mean, we got to the digestive enzymes, brain chemicals, everything, literally 16 hours of teaching. It was a certification course uh, that I teach over there. So, you know, I'm like, wow, these guys are educated. There's a lot of people in there. They're gonna, and, you know, it's time for the Q&A after two days of 16 hours of, of, of talk. So I'm like, wow, I'm ready. My brain nerve transmitters are firing. I'm like, oh, they're going to hit me with some crazy <clears throat> questions about biochemistry. I can't wait to hit them, you know. And just like kind of this interview we're doing here, they were just starting to kind of ask me questions. And guess what the first question after a 16-hour course was? The first question this guy had was, hey, how tall is Sylvester Stallone? Are you kidding me right now? Are, are you serious? I mean, that's, that shows you how big celebrities are, how big celebrity marketing yeah. is, how much interest there is in celebrities, that even after that course, the only question they were really concerned about is, hey, how tall is he? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Interesting. But talk a little bit about training. Um, I think that a lot of people generally are overtrained. What I mean by that is that, you know, overtraining can be worse than undertraining. Um, it, it's not that that easy to be overtrained, but most people think, "Hey, I gotta work out two hours a day or three hours a day." My God, I gotta you know uh, pull up a chair and live in the gym, and you know what I mean? And that's certainly not the case at all. 
what people are, 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 the new research is showing is that, you know, it's quality, not quantity. You know, 10 to 15 minutes of intense exercise three times a week can have many benefits to your health and wellness. You know, I would, me personally, it would, again, depend on your goals, right? Zaki, you may, you may, you may just want to do it just for health, just for health. You know, for base, you might want to do it because you want a 10-pack. You know what I mean? Or, uh, you know, right now I'm a two-pack Shakur, but I'm trying to get a six-pack but soon. But, uh, but you know, every I'm goal is different. Here, man. Every, every, <laughs> every goal is different. Every goal is different. So depending on the goal in general, I would say at least four to five times of, you know, weight training, minimum three, and then two or three days a week of cardio. You know, and the best time to do cardio, in my opinion, is first thing in the, in the morning on an empty stomach drinking a lot of water. Mm. And uh, that can allow you to, again, uh, cause more fat burning to occur and then eating afterwards. And again, it depends, again, what your, what your goal is. If, you're just, if your goal for cardio is just for heart health, then you can do it any time of the day. But if your goal is fat loss, then you would do it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. So, you know, in that range, I would never work out more than 45 minutes to an hour at a time ever. Um, how important are things like coffee and tea? What do you think about coffee in, in general? Well, a lot. I, I love coffee. I'm I'm a mocha <laughs> fanatic. No, um, actually, um, I think that if if your order has uh, too many words in it, it's probably not good for you. You know, mocha frappa, chino, whatever it's called. But I would recommend black coffee. Uh, it's really good for your health. In fact, a lot of studies have been showing that coffee has health benefits, uh, and and actually can enhance lifespan as well. Uh, individuals who are coffee drinkers. So. Uh, I'm a big fan of coffee. I'm a big fan of tea. I like oolong tea. I like green tea. Oolong tea is very good because it enhances metabolism. It's really good for your health as well. Uh, but I think coffee before cardiovascular work allows you to burn more fat because caffeine allows you to release fat into your bloodstream uh, to be used as fuel, so to speak. Uh, it also has many, many health benefits, uh, many ergogenic benefits for athletes. And as we all know, uh, when we're sleepy and tired, uh, you know, late at night, a cup of coffee can really give you a mental boost um, and allow you to increase neurotransmitters and help you focus better as well. So I'm a big fan of coffee. I'm a big fan of caffeine. Um, and I think it has a lot of polyphenols and other nutrients that can allow you to have better health as well. Is there such a thing as too much? Uh, there's always such a thing as too much. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it goes back to thing. moderation again. Hey, listen, it's like the movies that Zucky would know. You know too much of a good thing is sometimes is, is not great. You know, do we need a Home Alone 3? I mean, did we really? I don't know. You know, <laughs> too much of a good thing. You know what I mean? You can't have too much of a good thing. So um, I would say that, you know, in, in the case of coffee, yes. Uh, it depends on your tolerance level. I would recommend that you don't be addicted to it, obviously. But, right. you know, one to three cups daily, I don't think can be, you know, that harmful to you depending on your tolerance level and also depending on what type of coffee you're drinking. Uh, but a couple of days, you should, have, you should have no problems whatsoever. And same thing related to tea? Uh, tea, you can actually drink more of because, oh, okay. uh, you know, it has the polyphenols. Uh, green tea has something called EGCG, epigallocatechin gallate for you biochemist fanatics out there. Wow. <laughs> um, say that 10 times in a row. But epigallocatechin <laughs> gallate um, allows you to increase thermogenesis. It actually targets something in your body that's called brown fat. Now, brown fat is different than white fat. See, you, people used to think that, you know, all fat is created equal. Well, actually... I talked about this 15 years ago, and scientists kind of ridiculed me because they're like, what? Brown fat? What are you talking about? A good type of fat? No, no, no. Only babies have that. When you grow up, you lose that. But actually, new research shows that you adults have brown fat, which is a good fat. Brown fat helps you burn more fat. It's kind of contrary to popular thinking but or popular belief, but you know, if you stimulate this sort of brown fat, you can actually burn more fat in your body. It's the, brown, it's a, it's the type of fat that's uh, hidden deep inside your abdomen, between your collarbones. Um, and it's found in certain areas in your neck and in your body. Um, and if you stimulate that, you can actually burn more fat. And green tea has been shown to uh, stimulate that along with CLA and some other nutrients as well. So, you know, science is always evolving. It's always an interesting field. It's never a dull day in this field. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a chai d drinker, and what you've told me is uh, full, full speed ahead with, with my, my chai. Uh, so. That's, of course, uh, no sugar, right? <laughs> right. Um, I, I choose to ignore that. I don't know how much Kashmiri chai, you know, relates here. Uh, yeah. By the way, it all it depends on the type of tea you're drinking. Like white tea is really good for you. Black tea is good. Oolong tea, green tea. Those are the ones you want to stick with, you know? Okay. So uh, now I wanted to kind of delve right into a topic that we've uh, touched on, and I keep saying I want to do about a whole segment. 
to, of the show to this, and that is related to the specific health issues that we find uh, really running rampant in the Muslim community. Uh, you know, I, I recently listened to a presentation that actually Sheikh Hamza Yusuf did at the recent uh, RIS National Convention, where he was talking about the alarming rates of heart disease, diabetes in the Muslim world. But I think that, I mean, that's as related to the Muslim community here in America. Absolutely. I mean, I think it, it, it's very, you know, uh, it's coincidental with the uh, American population, which is, you know, 67 percent of the population is obese. You know, the rates of heart disease and diabetes, especially among kids, uh, is alarming. It's an alarming rate. And whether it's Muslims, Christians or Jews, I mean, you know, or, or it's Buddhist or anybody else, they're experiencing the same thing. Well, one thing about about body fat, it's uh, non-denominational. Right. So, uh, you know, right. everybody's afflicted right. by that now. And really, it has to do with overeating. It has to do with the food quality. Now, uh, South Asians uh, and I would say even Arabs or in the, in the Muslim community, what I've noticed, uh, yeah. me personally, you know, is that everything is – we're a food-based culture. Yes. In other words, everything so is food-based. Hey, did you see a new restaurant that opened? we got to try it. You know, it's like, right. why? You know, hey – the 40, what's the first question you ask when you attend a wedding? Oh my God, who's catering? You know, those are the things. Those are the first questions. Frasco. When you go to an iftar, when you break your fast, you say, "Well, what kind of food is going to be there?" You know what I mean? That's okay. the, that's what that's what we've become concerned about. We've been concerned about uh, food. And Ali had a great quote. Rabbi Allah he had a great quote that said, "You know, I wasn't created uh, to you know eat food like tied up cattle. You know, that wasn't mm-hmm. what I was created for. I wasn't created to eat delicious foods like tied up cattle." That's not my. That wasn't. That wasn't what I what was I was meant to do. And you know, you should eat food for function in a lot of ways. But now we've made food into something that's uh, satiety. It, it's based on sort of you know feeling an emotional void or any issues we have. We turn not to ourselves, not to our spirituality, but we turn to food. You know, mm-hmm. we get that gallon of ice cream and cry over it watching a movie, right? Because we had a bad day or we broke up or whatever happened. Right. You know, emotional. Um, yeah, listen, you know, that, you know, that's another uh, side, complete side note, but, uh, you know, divorce and all those things can have emotional trauma. It can cause binge eating or and we've seen binge eating occur in, uh, in many individuals. But, you know, those are the kind of things that are affecting the community. So it's really what it takes is a thought shift. What I mean by that is really looking at food differently, you know, looking at food truly for function. And mm. if you follow the prophetic tradition, if you follow the Sahaba, if you follow the, 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 the scholars of old, you know, they looked at food very differently than we looked at food. Really. I mean, they were adamant about food. They were concerned about food. They were right. concerned about having it. I mean, so they saw someone with a gut, they'd be concerned about that person. They would yeah, say, this yeah. is abnormal. This is not right. Something's wrong. You know, you're taking <laughs> advantages of the blessings of God, you know? So these are the kind of, this is a thought kind of thing. It has to be a, a, a mental, emotional shift that looks at food differently. In fact, it's funny because when I look at food, it's almost like the Terminator. You know, with the huh. computers, the computer screen, and you're analyzing every little part of it, and you're like, you know, you're looking at every single thing, and that's how it has to be. You know, before you eat anything, before you put any single morsel of food in your mouth, you know, you should be concerned about what it's going to do to your body. What will that food do to your body? Will it help you or hurt you? And this is the kind of thought-provoking things that takes time and effort, and really, it's it's also peer pressure, right? When you go to a party, you see people loading their food up and, you know, they're wasting food. And that's a whole other issue, right? They're wasting so much food. You know, take a little bit. Eat a small amount and move on. And that's what it is. And enjoy the company. And don't right. come, you know, they, they always say, come for the, you know, uh, come for the company, but stay for the food. Not come for the food and stay for the company. That's right. You know, Rehan, um, I know you have a lot on your plate, uh, pun intended. <laughs> and uh, But well, I think that... One of the undiscovered gems, I think, in the Muslim tradition is, like you alluded to, about the fact that there is so much prophetic guidance uh, related to food, related to what we eat and how much we eat. But uh, I think that that's something that's really been untapped uh, with regards to you don't see like a real vibrant tradition as you do with regards to, you know, spiritual issues or mental issues, you know, related specifically, really drawing on the treasure, like we talked about, uh, you know, the prophetic guidance related to food and things like that. So I think someone like you is best situated to really, you know, be out there talking about these issues or writing about these issues. 
Uh, well, I, I'm definitely not a scholar. But I can no, you but, but you know enough in terms of, like like you said, the prophetic guidance out there, the gluttony was considered one of the seven deadly sins. And there was a correlation between gluttony, lust, because they all related to appetites. And anytime you have an insatiable appetite, you know, you run the risk of damaging your soul. Absolutely. I mean, I, I agree that, again, going back to the, the overeating thing, uh, overeating dulls your brain. It slows you down. It actually right. makes you less productive. So actually, you know what's interesting? It's going back to Ramadan fasting. There's a new um, technique now that they're using um, for dieting purposes. I think it could be used effectively. It's called intermittent fasting. And inter intermittent fasting is basically you fast one or two days a week or 16 hours a day, and you don't eat any food. You, drink, you can drink water, I guess. But a lot of the research they're using is a really popular concept now, intermittent wow. fasting. Um, you may have heard of it in a lot of the blogs or radio mm -hmm. shows or TV shows, but um, intermittent fasting actually comes from Ramadan fasting. And all the research they use to support it, most of the research is done on Ramadan fasting. So we know that fasting can certainly benefit you. And that goes contrary to gluttony. It's completely opposite. You know, right. And in fact, many people who fast have gluttony at the time of breaking the fast, which is completely destructive and counterproductive to yeah, the fasting exactly. process, uh, physically yeah. and and mentally, and in fact, research actually showed that starvation actually causes your brain to function better. So, the, hmm. so not overeating, eating less, small amounts of food can actually make your brain sharper because you have this fight or flight response, which makes you more productive, which makes you, you know, work harder. And you can actually be more focused and mentally, you know, really sharp and acute by causing your body to be a little bit hungry at times, That's a little right. bit hungry at times. Whereas the, the gluttony, as you mentioned, overeating can have the complete opposite effect, That's as right. you know. Uh, overeating and then the good old nap on the couch, you know, as you, as you say. I was say, well, what is, well, what is the sort of most offer be to statement after a big meal? Oh, man, I could use a nap. <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah, and so exactly. we're going back to the idea of the seven deadly sins, sloth, which is spiritual laziness. Absolutely. is another deadly sin. And again, related directly to gluttony. But if your physical isn't right, your spiritual can't be right. So when people tell me and they kind of jokingly say, well, why do I need to die? Why are you talking about abs? And I'm like, oh, listen, listen. Yeah. You know, I'm not talking about this for your sort of uh, looks, although you look better for sure. But I'm talking about it. How can you pray when you're absolutely full? How can your mind function? How can you, how could you really reach out to your creator when your body is not physically ready to do it? When you, when you overeat, when you don't, your mind's not sharp, right? We call it the khushu or sort of the you know connection. We don't we don't have that when we're overeating. There's, it's, it's not possible. So That's when right. you eat less, when you exercise, when you fire those brain neuro neurotransmitters, then your prayers can be better. You can become more spiritually active and conscious actually as well. Absolutely. And so you have to use spirituality as sort of an outlet and not food as an outlet. Mm -hmm. And you know, people often say like the human being is a composite of the mind, body, and soul. But I would argue and I would submit to you that from the Muslim tradition, it's always looked at the human being holistically, you know, Absolutely. and not as a composite between mind, body and soul. But that all of those three dimensions, if you will, of the human being are completely interrelated. Absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, exercise. What's interesting is that exercise, I don't want to digress, but exercise has been in our tradition since the beginning. Really, Correct. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, Umar bin Khattab, he used to teach us that, you know, when they used to shoot arrows from target to target, they used to walk and grab their arrows and walk back. He said, run between the targets. Mm -hmm. Why are you walking? Run. You know, he, they, he promoted exercise. That's what they did. They were, they were eating well and they were exercising. And that's why, in some ways, they were successful as well because right. of, of their physical fitness. Right, right. And, and to just conclude on that note, you know, you were talking about Omar ibn al-Khattab, the second uh, Khalifa or Caliph in Islam. You know, once he was making tawaf and there was uh, circumambulating the Kaaba, and he saw another man in Ahram, so his midsection was shown, and he had a belly. And he right. said, wouldn't that look better on someone else? You know, in a sense uh, <laughs> that it doesn't belong on you, because you're obviously consuming too much food, and there's probably someone out there who doesn't have enough food. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, and that's what it boils down to. And we'll conclude with that. I mean, really what it boils yeah. down to, like you said, a complete total approach to physical health, wellness and fitness and, you know, combining nutrition, combining supplements, training, you know, mentally, spiritually, all that thing. It all works hand in hand, really, at the end of the day. Right. So, Rehan, thank you so much for being a guest. I think it's been a very fruitful discussion. 
It's been uh, highly educational for me and I'm sure for our listeners as well. So before we leave, where can people find you online? Uh, you know, you can follow me on Twitter at Six Pack Diet Plan, S-I-X. And you can also go to my website, the Six Pack Diet Plan dot com, the longest web name in history, uh, <laughs> the, the Six Pack Diet Plan dot com. And you know what? Email me, uh, you know, through the, my websites. And, you know, I really do check emails here and there. I get hundreds, but I do, you know, do check them uh, when I can. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook. I'm all all over the social media scene. You know, I'm not like the kids doing Snapchat and all that. But man, the main stuff I'm on. <laughs> I'm old. Come on. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you again. Uh, it's been a real honor having you as a guest and been, good no, luck to been, you. Uh, good luck to all your endeavors. It, it's been absolutely fabulous. I got to say, but uh, thank you guys for having me and uh, you know, all the best to you eat less and be more. Thank you. And uh, thank you to the listeners for joining us for another episode of diffuse congruence. And as always, folks, please do hit us up on iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Please write us a review. Leave us a star rating. Let people know what you think of the show. Let us know what you think of the show. Email us at diffusedcongruence at gmail.com. And we will look forward to seeing you again the first Friday of next month. Thank you for listening.